Uh, we, we will be in Mark chapter five, verses one through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. So they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp stones. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before him. With a shriek, he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the spirit, Come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, for there are many of us inside this man. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into the pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. And the evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. The herdsmen fled to the town nearby and surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. And people rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. And hear this word. He was sitting there, fully clothed, perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. Then those who had seen what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs. And the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, now, no, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the 10 towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he had told them. And this is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated and let's pray. Father God, we honor you. Father God, we honor you. Father God, we honor you. There is no one like you, Father. Oh God, as we open up your word this morning, I pray would you take my lips and speak through them. Take our thoughts and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. And lest you speak, nothing of significance can be spoken. Give us your word. Lord Jesus, we pray, and amen, and amen. Well, the grace and peace of Jesus be with you this morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Pastor Andrew, uh, and it is an honor. I give honor to the Lord and to Pastor Ben for the opportunity to be here with you this morning. Uh, and I don't come to you as someone who has it all figured out, and I come to you as someone who is just is a sinner saved by grace, looking to seek after and pursue Jesus this morning. And so my prayer and hope for all of you, if it's your first time or if you've been here your whole life, is that you'll take that opportunity with me this morning. And we'll press in and see what Jesus has to say to us this morning. 
Before we get into the word, I wanted to make sure and share a, a special invitation as we we're looking to Thanksgiving this week. Uh, an amazing couple in our church family, the Gittins, so many of you know them and, and, and have appreciated them. I know they are a blessing in my life. Uh, they, they have extended the invitation that if there's any couples in our church family this, this Thanksgiving who are not going to be able to go home, they wanted to make a special invitation to you to come to lunch with them. Uh, and I, I'm grateful for that because guess what? We all come from different walks of life. And so taking the opportunity that uh, if we're not able to gather with our blood family, we can gather with our spiritual family. And so I wanna, if you want, if you're interested in that, make sure to call the church office and we can get you set up with that. I'm grateful for Debbie and Sterling's for their offering uh, for that. Uh, and so I'm grateful for that. Mm. So I wanna start out with a question to you this morning as we open up God's word. Have you ever heard something that sounds amazing or surprising, but you missed it? Maybe you were watching a movie with friends and family and you might have been on your phone and as everyone gasped and you looked up and said, what happened, what happened, what happened? Or maybe you were driving and you were talking to friends in the car and then you hear something in, you, in the front as you drove by it and you said, what happened? And people were like, you didn't see that? That was amazing. There are so many things within us as we were wired together as people that inhabit this response of amazement, of breathtaking, or taking your breath away, or surprising, right? These are emotions that have been wired within us. Maybe you've seen the beauty of creation. I wanna call Bryant to, to trigger a picture here of a place that I saw. Uh, this is Red Rocks Amphitheater in the Denver, Colorado area. Uh, a gorgeous, gorgeous, beautiful creation of the Lord himself. We got the opportunity to worship the Lord in this space. And there are so many of us that as we sit and we look at something like that, we can't help but sit back and go, wow, God, you are amazing. But sometimes though, whether it's a good thing or a not so good thing, that amazing thing, that thing that causes a surprising nature in us might be bad, it might be good, but sometimes it distracts us because we are so busy trying to get from one thing to another, we miss what is going on. We miss what is present. And I think for so many of us, we can miss what Jesus is trying to do in the here and the now. You see, God's heart, for those of you who are followers of Jesus, the beautiful thing is God imprints himself on your heart, and it's beautiful. But my question is, do we take the time to recognize that? Today, we're closing out our follow series as we've been talking about the beautiful understanding of what discipleship is. And I don't know about you, but God has been speaking to me boldly over this series. We've heard about abiding in Christ, walking in the light. But I think for you and I today, as we close this, we have to realize that there is an aspect of discipleship that looks like relinquishing control seeking to trust that God's plans for us are better than our plans for us. Am I speaking to anybody this morning? And to come for you and I to be able to sit in the breathtaking moments of who God is. And this morning, as you heard the scripture, as Jesus entered the region of the Gerasenes, he experienced a moment in a person that one might call breathtaking, but not in the way maybe some of you have thought. Maybe not in the way some of you have thought. But as Jesus encountered this person, what occurred was full transformation from the inside out. And it's so important for you and I to understand whether you and I experience good or bad, breathtaking, amazing, surprising moments in our life, whatever it may be, Jesus meets every single one of those moments with his presence. And so at the end of the day, my prayer and hope is that if you look at this scripture, I believe that God is trying to show us that Jesus desires full transformation for you and I. The question is, will we take the time to sit down, be in his presence, 
and be available to it. If we're gonna be able to experience that, we have to stop. We have to slow down and we have to do what the demon-possessed man did, sit in the presence of the Lord. So what is transformation? I believe that transformation is to completely turn from the ways of this world and to seek a life that looks like Jesus. So you say, Pastor, what does that look like? It looks like trading in the priorities of this world, power, money, influence, and accepting the priorities of Jesus, love, joy, peace, patience, humility, truth. We are trading those things in. And if you, if maybe if you've grown up in the church before, I'm, I know that not everyone has, but if you've heard this story before, so oftentimes the church will focus on the miracle. And the miracle is beautiful. I don't want to take part in that. But I really want to encourage us this morning to take a look at a different part of this story because I think we miss it sometimes. We miss a beautiful part of the story. If you look at the beginning of the scripture, I'm, I'm gonna be referring back and forth to the scripture a lot. So uh, I would encourage you if you have your Bibles or a phone or something like that to have it available. Um, you see, if you've grown up in the church, you'll experience the beginning of this story. But if you haven't, I wanna make sure and walk through this. You see, this man had been possessed by demons for years. And what had ended up happening was he was so uh, uh, unpredictable that what was happening was they put him on the out, outskirts of the city. He lived in the tombs and on the outskirts where there was death, right? People would try to bind him and he would break free, right? He would scream and howl. And people felt unsafe around him. And he had been gnashing his teeth and what ended up happening here is he was an outcast. The city really outcasted him to a later part of the city. But what ends up happening is as Jesus frees him for the first time in years, he makes the first decision in freedom to say, I need to sit down and I need to hear from the author. I need to hear from Jesus. I am no longer the same and I wanna know more. I need to keep coming back I need to know more. Is there anybody else in the house that wants that, needs that this morning? You see, as we experience the presence of Jesus, we realize that our breath is taken away and that the full presence and full transformation of Jesus can only occur in his presence. Part of following Jesus, though, is just stopping and taking the time to sit in his presence. But don't miss what I just said there first, before sitting in his presence, stopping. Say stop. Stop. stop and sit in his presence. We miss that part. You see, we can't take the time sometimes because we are so distracted. But what ends up happening is when we live into our distraction, we can sometimes miss that God has something available for us right here and right now. And so I think this morning as we open up God's word, there are three things that this story teaches us about being in his presence that is so important. And it relies back to this idea of discipleship, of following after Jesus. Because guess what? It does not just start when we say yes to Jesus. It does not just start in the transformation. It goes day after day after day after day. And we have to remember that. Those folks who were just baptized, it is not the ending point, it's the beginning point as we experience life. I love this quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He says this, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. Are we available, church, to what Jesus wants to do within us? He has good words. He has encouraging words. But he wants to meet with you this morning. The question is, will we be available to it? As we look in this word this morning, the first thing that we experience in his presence is that there is authority in his presence. Say authority. No, authority. You got to say authority with some authority. Say authority. That's right. We experience authority in his presence. Right? Look with me in verses 6 through 10. 
When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt down before him. And he cried out with a loud voice, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. For he, before he had told him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. What is your name, he asked him. My name is Legion, he answered him, because we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the region. What I, what I think is super interesting, if you look in verse six, you see he immediately, he met Jesus and immediately ran toward him and bowed low to him. Some translations say knelt before and bowed in reverence. For you and I, it's important to recognize that demons even recognize the authority that Jesus has, right? He does not just bow, he begs Jesus not to send them out of the area. We know the truth that comes later as Jesus gives the permission for the demons to leave the man and go into the pigs. But there is something deeper here. Demons, associates of the adversary, love the opportunity to inhabit people. Why do they love that opportunity? They hate the image of God. They hate the image of God. I think it's super important to recognize that. This is why they attack humans. If we are people who are created in God's image, it's going to be a demon's right, and it's going to be a demon's attempt. It's going to be a demon's, uh, as, an advers- as an associate of the adversary, to attack that which is contrary to the adversary. Right? The question is, I think for you and I, as we experience this, if demons and the adversary recognizes God's authority, will we? Will we? So many times we need to recognize that God does not just have the heart to love and protect us, to transform us. He has the authority to do that as well. Matthew 28, 18, the Great Commission. Uh, you've, you may have heard this before where Jesus says, go into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. But sometimes we miss a part of that right before it in verse 18. He, Jesus, says to the, Jesus says this to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So what does it look like for you to re- not just recognize the love that Christ has for you, but the authority he has in every situation? In this world, the name of Jesus carries more authority than anything that this world can offer. And the question is, will we call upon it? What do I mean when I say call upon it? Say it, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And when you're in the midst of the situation, you can declare the name of Jesus. Just saying Jesus over the situation holds power. It holds authority. You see, the same authority who casts out demons, heals the sick, created the earth, desires to show up for you in every battle and in every situation. It's not always sometimes in the way that we think or feel like he should, but his ways are always greater than ours. Some of the things that I've had the opportunity to do over my time in ministry, one of the things we got to do was go over to the Middle East and care for the labor cap class community uh, that was over there. What ended up happening in the Middle East is folks would come in, right, and they would work to build these beautiful buildings and these beautiful conference centers But what happens was where where you and I experience a right versus wrong culture on this side of the world, on that side of the world, there is an honor and shame culture that takes place, right? And so what ends up happening is the way that the roles go on, the man of the house, their responsibility is to provide for the family. And if they aren't doing that, they are, provide, they are putting shame on themselves in the household. I'm trying to explain this to you uh, to be able to understand some of the cultural things that are going on over there. But what ends up happening here is as they leave their families to go and work, what ends up happening is they are locked into this arrangement and this contract for years. And so what ends up happening is they're away from their families, from their, from their spouses, 
And although these folks were not able to be clinically diagnosed, the missionary that we worked with said that one in four would have been clinically diagnosed as depressed. And so you can only imagine the things that might take place or the things that we can resort to in those moments. And so what we would do as a team is we would go into these compounds that they lived in and the team would find a person of peace as scripture talks about, someone who is open to the idea of the gospel and to create opportunities for friends and family to come around and we would come in and we would share the gospel, right? And they would be given an opportunity to take part in small house churches that were already happening before we got there and were happening after we left. And so we were there that night. We had a beautiful night where we, got, where we were able to share the gospel. We saw people who were giving their lives to say, I want to be a part and know more who this Jesus is. And as we were leaving, the person of peace came up to me and said, will you pray for me? And I just remember sitting there in fear. Why was that? I sat there and I thought about that person in the Middle East. And I thought about all the persecution that that person would face. And all the fear that they had to instill, they had to experience on a daily basis more than I, get the, more than I deal with in a year. Who am I that they would want me to pray for them? And the missionary we were with was walking right there with me and he turned and he looked at me and he said, Andrew, you hold the spirit of the living God living inside of you. Do not minimize what can happen when you call upon his name. And so in confidence, I prayed for him this morning, not in my own confidence, but in the confidence of who God is and his ability to be bigger than any other situation we can face. And as I sat there and received that, my prayer, I believe God has given that to every single one of us today. Amen. If you are a follower of Jesus, you hold the spirit of the living God inside of you today. Yes. Do not minimize yes. what can happen when you call upon its name. Yes. If you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, the beautiful thing is that opportunity is available to you right now. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But I want to challenge you in that. There is power, there is authority in the name of Jesus. You see, when we submit our lives to his way, we can experience the authority of Christ to show up, transform us, mold us, and equip us in every situation. The second thing we experience in his presence is peace. There is peace in his presence. We learned first that there is authority in his presence. There's peace in his presence. Verses 14 through 17. The men who tended them ran off and reported it to the town and countryside. And people went to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the man who had been demon possessed, hear this, sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it described it to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs, and they began to beg him to leave the, reason, the region. For the first time in years, years, all the demons that were in him, all the decisions that he could not make in his own body because he was bound, not just physically, but inside of him as well. He was held captive. And for the first time, as he opened his eyes in freedom, and he saw Jesus standing right there, his first response and his first decision was to come and to sit and to say, Jesus, I don't want to move. I don't want to take another breath. I don't want to say another word until you speak. What a powerful, powerful image. But hear me when I say this, as we look about and talk about this idea of discipleship, I love that this man can be an example for that. Why is that? This man had not 
uh, wasn't putting on his best. He, he wasn't just coming from home. He wasn't always happy. He had been through some stuff. He had been through some stuff. And he had realized there is, he had realized that there is someone that wants to make him new and there is someone that he wants to experience that peace, Jesus. Hear me though, peace is not the absence of conflict. It's a realization that being in Christ's presence is greater than anything else. It does not mean the situation is always resolved in the moment, but it's a reminder that being in God's presence is always what we need. Man. So my question to you is, as you look at this man this morning, as you look at the response that he gives, how many people are desiring the peace that God offers? In this world, there is so much that is opposite to peace. Your spirit and your body may be going, and all that there is going on is noise and noise and noise, and you are going and you're going and you're going, and all you want is peace. All you want is peace. Think about a stop sign. How many people, as you hit a stop sign, make a firm stop, but sometimes in the distraction and the busyness of getting from one place to another, and don't lie in church, you may, you may not stop fully at that stop sign and you keep on going. I won't tell anybody. Let's be honest. You see, Jesus invites us to stop and sit in his presence. Man. You see, the demon-possessed man was fully clothed in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus and hearing what he has to say. Why did he do that? After years of bondage, of years of captivity, he realized that in Christ's presence is the only place that his soul could find rest and peace. So why did it scare people? They came back after they heard the news and can you only imagine as people arrived back and they saw Jesus in this demon-possessed man or who was once that way, you know they had to be going like, hey, isn't that, isn't that that guy? Hey, isn't that the, that the man who was on the outskirts of the city? What is going on? And they were afraid. You see, the world teaches us to flock to things that are known before those that are not. You see, the Israelites did that in the wilderness, desiring to go back to Egypt. We do that in our work, in our homes, seeking to be busy, because even if it's stressful, even if it's wrong, it's known. And we flock to the known so much more and so much more easily than we do the unknown. But what Christ is trying to show us is that we need to slow down. It's only in him where our soul will find rest. And before we can sit, we have to recognize that in his presence, we can find peace. We can find peace. And the final thing we can experience is this. We can experience peace truth in his presence. We recognize that there was authority in his presence. We recognize that there is peace in his presence. And now we can recognize that there is truth in his presence, verses 18 through 20. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged him, begged him earnestly that he might remain with him. Jesus did not let him, but told him, go home to your own people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So he went out and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And they were amazed. You see, out of fear for the unknown, the people made a response to that fear, begging Jesus to leave. What I love here is that the one who had been previously filled with demons said, hey, Jesus, can I go with you? Why do you think he asked that? How many people know in here that there is a difference 
between hearing about the truth and experiencing the truth, right? There's so much different. This man had experienced truth and it was not found in himself or a thing. It was found in Jesus and he wanted to show that difference to everyone. So why did Jesus say no? Was the boat too full? Was there something else going on? No, no. Jesus knew that this man was the best testimony for the city of who God was and what had been done. You see, there's a difference between hearing about truth and experiencing it. Super important here. What we experience here is that there is truth in Jesus' presence, right? The truth is that there is nobody too far gone to be able to experience the power of transformation, the power of life change, the power of not just your body change, but your mind change and your soul change, your emotions change. Every single part of you can change where we trade in the priorities of this world and we take on the priorities of Jesus. It's available to you. The truth is that Jesus is our healer and our friend. One life being healed, one life being saved, one life being transformed is worth it. There's truth in his presence. So what about you and I? That truth that was available then is available to you and I now. And I think what the adversary wants to do is to take our eyes off the truth. As we, as, we, as we prepare to walk this out and prepare to enter our time of closing, I, I share this with you. When I entered into ministry, uh, I was a part of some ministry circles of people who had a lot of years of experience and a lot of years they had written books, they had preached all over the world, they had experienced a lot of things. And as the, as the young kid, as the new guy on the block, the adversary got into that. You're not enough. Look at all this experience that these people have. You don't deserve to be at the table. You don't deserve to be a part of the team. And I remember sitting there going, maybe he's right. And I was sitting in my bed one evening and I was reading a book and a a coworker at the time called and I was really worried because it was late at night and Thought something was wrong. So I answered, said, is everything okay? And the coworker said, Andrew, I'm out prayer walking. I have a word from the Lord for you. Do you want to hear it? I said, let me think about that. Yes. (laughs) And so he said, I don't know what this means. I don't know what this means to you. But this is the word. The Lord has placed you and equipped you and prepared you for the place that you're in, for the role that you're doing, for what is in front of you, for this time and this place. So live in confidence of the truth and rebuke the thing that is not of the truth. And as I sat there beginning to weep, he said, does that do anything for you? (laughs) As I share that with you this morning, the adversary desires, it's his greatest mean, his greatest tactic to take your eyes off the truth of who God created you to be. The truth is he has equipped you. He has prepared you. He has called you where you are, even if it's hard in the moment, even if everything is seemingly trying to come down upon you, he has equipped you and called you and prepared you. And here's this truth, especially if you hear all this, you may not be a follower of Jesus. I wanna hear this, I want you to hear this truth because this is what's in his presence. God loves you so much not for the person that you are, or not for the person you're trying to be, but for the person that you are. That he sent his only son to live on this earth, 
He taught, he healed, he preached, he loved. And he was met with mockery, pain, and the cross. And as he was put on that cross, as he was placed up on there, what he did was all of the wrongdoings, all of the sin that was on our shoulders, he took it on. And he said, put it on me. Because he loves you. And he wants to give you the opportunity right now. All you have to do is share in that sin. We're no, nobody here is perfect. I'm not perfect. Anybody up here is not perfect. And saying, God, will you lead me? I want to trade in the priorities of this world for the priorities of you. Will you show me? And what ends up happening is through a life of discipleship, being molded to look more like Jesus, we can be like that demon-possessed man who sit at the feet of Jesus, having been through some stuff, saying, God, will you speak? God, will you move? I can't do anything else apart from you. And watch. You just watch and see what he does. You just watch and see what he does. It'll be unlike anything you have experienced before. So my prayer and hope is we close and we're gonna pray. But as we pray, I wanna encourage you just to close your eyes. So many of us are so busy. This world throws so many things at us. And right now you may want peace. Right now you may be stuck in the midst of those things that may feel like bondage and you may not know how to get out. Will you just call upon the name of the Lord? What does that mean? Just say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. Because as we learned today, discipleship isn't looking like being put all together and, and coming in to a bunch of perfect people. It looks like coming into a room of people who've been through some stuff who knows that Jesus is the only way. But the question is, will we make ourselves available to it? Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We love you. And God, I pray for every single person who's in this room, every single person who is online, every single person who says, yeah, pastor, that sounds good, but is it real? I pray your nearness would touch them now. It wouldn't be anything that has been said up until this point. It would be you, God. That's what we desire, you. A meeting with you. God, I pray in their homes they would have a meeting with you. I pray in their schools they would have a meeting with you. I pray in their hearts they would have a meeting with you. I pray in the parts of their lives that feel the most broken, the most painful, that you would meet them in that spot and you would heal them from the inside out. Our hearts are ready. And so in your own hearts right now, would you make yourself available? I wanna challenge you in that. He desires to transform you, but we have to first stop. It's in that life of being molded that we get to experience freedom. And it's available to every single one of us. God, I pray your presence would flood this place. And it wouldn't just stay here, it would go out with us as we leave this place. We want more of you and less of us, God. More of you and less of us. Guide us, guide us, guide us, we ask in the matchless name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. My, Otto, you want to lead us in something before we leave? Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Peace.
peace of God be with you. Go in peace.